We are in chapter 16, and we have started talking about the bowls as the last part of God's wrath. And we got down into around verses 4 through 8, kind of, or verses 4 through 7, that little bundle right there. I didn't quite get done. I want to go back to that part again. Let me pick up in verse 4. I'm going to read verses 4 through 7. And it says, Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O holy one, because you judged these things. For they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So we talked about the second bowl and how that was going to turn a lot of the seawater into blood and kill the living things. Now, the third bowl here, notice what it says, is poured into the rivers and the springs of waters. These people are not going to have anything to drink. If they drink, what's it going to be? Think about that. Yeah, yuck. Think about that for a minute. You cannot sustain yourself very long without water. You've got to be hydrated. You've got to be able to take water. Sounds to me like there's not going to be a lot of water. But here's the interesting thing. <laughs> when I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous are you. Now, I'm not sure in, in, in the New American Standard translation, you is capitalized. I don't know what your translation may say there, but notice that. Who do you think that angel is talking about? Well, mine says a Lord. A Lord, okay. Same, then that's the same inference there. Yeah. Talking about Lord, our God, righteous are you who are and who were. Again, that's how we refer to God, who was, who is, and who always will be. O Holy One. Now, I don't want to pass that over too quickly, but I want you to think about that for just a minute. We talk about God being holy. Do you ever really stop and think about the sovereignness of God? Think about that for just a minute. You know what I mean when I say sovereign? He is the one and only above all. There is no other. There is no replacement. There is none higher. He is the only one. Think about that for just a minute. We should be thankful. I'm going to ask you this first. Get this out of the way because I'm going to come back to it. If you die today, do you know you're going to heaven? Yes. You serve a sovereign God. Your God is able to do anything he chooses, anything he wants. He is always in control. Think about that for a minute, and that should put a smile on your face. I say that for this reason. We were just chatting a little bit before class, sort of about the state of affairs, if you will. Oh, my. I, 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 I'm, I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed, I'm disappointed, I'm frustrated to think of which way this country might be headed. And I'm not going to turn this into a political forum, that's not my point at all. My point is this, we need to be able to, to take some comfort to know you have a God who still loves you. And no matter what happens, you have a God who is in charge, who's taking, who will take control of this. And, you know, I, I, this is just me. I keep looking at, at the, as I say, the state of affairs today. And again, I don't mean this in a political sense at all, but I'm, I'm thinking of back when the children of Israel kept telling God we want a king because everybody else has a king and what did God tell them 
you, 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 don't, you don't need a king. And what did they say back? Oh, yeah, yeah. We know what's best. We want one. And I'm not trying to say either of these people who are running for political office is a king or anything like that. What I'm saying is the people have no idea right now what to do, where to go, and, and we seem to push God in the background when we need him now more than ever. You, you continually, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but you continually hear stories, I'm sure, of people who have been persecuted or, I may go ahead and just say exon and not exonerated, but um, exercised from a group or some city government or state government because they are showing godly beliefs. Folks, it's a tough time right now. I'm going to go out on the limb a little bit and say you're going to be challenged in the next coming while to maintain your belief more so than ever before. Now, this, this kind of came to me this past week studying some of this. And like I said, I, I'm going to go on a limb to say this. But you recall when we talked about after God raptured his church, what you had left on this earth was a body then of non-believers. Everybody else who believed God, who believed God, he took them up already. We've got scripture. Doesn't remember last week I said we don't the rapture is not defined that way in the church in, in the Bible. There is no word no mention of the word rapture, but there are more than one scripture that talks about how God is going to take his believers and meet them in the air. You believe that? Yes. Absolutely I believe that. I believe that is another way of defining the rapture of the church. I told you then at that point we'll begin and we went to Daniel and looked at the time periods. We studied all that. I brought scripture to show you where it says specifically, talking about the weeks. Well, weeks means years, and there's a seven-week period, which equates to seven years. That's going to be the time of the tribulation, and basically all hell on earth is going to break loose. And it's going to be very difficult. We talked about the appointment of the 144,000, and we talked about the appointment of the, or, or the identification of the two witnesses. And it's going to be tough. During that time, and I told you this, tried to get you to get a visual picture there, how tough it's going to be for a believer to exist in that time period because of the conditions that they're going to be under. You remember talking about all that? Okay. That very thing, not, not that we're going to be in a tribulation, but that very set of parameters are going to come true right now, I believe, because you are going to be challenged as more than ever before in the coming times to maintain your belief and be able to show it and be able to boldly proclaim the word of God and boldly proclaim that you are a child of God and do it without fear of repercussion. Look at it today. Again, I get the luxury. I can turn your clock back about 20, 30, 40 years, since most of y'all are older than that. <laughs> Notice I said most. Turn the clock back and think. What is this, 2016? Let's just go back. Go back to 1975, 40 years ago. Can you remember back in 1975? If you professed to be a Christian, were you ostracized in any way? No. If you demonstrated your belief in God, were you chastised or persecuted in any way? If you boldly proclaimed the word of God, did anybody challenge you or tell you you can't do that? Now let's look at today. Every one of those three questions I just asked you, the answer today is yes. I heard recently 
read a little story. It was an off. It wasn't main news. It wasn't mainline news of a person in state government who was asked to stop declaring her belief in God even though she was professing it in the off hours. Not even doing it at work. Folks, that's where we got to today. You, you used to have a climate and a culture that would I don't want to say allow, I, I, I'll say it this way, allow you to, to profess your faith and profess your belief in God and let you live your life as a practicing Christian. That culture's gone today. We've said a long time ago, you, you were in the silent majority, you're now in the silent minority. And people are staying away from God in droves because they don't have a need for God anymore. They say it's seventy-two percent. Is it that high now? They say it's seventy-two percent. I'm not seeing statistics, but I'll take that. Think about that for just a minute. Now I know, as as preacher says from the pulpit often, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You wouldn't be here today. If either it wasn't a divine appointment or you you believe in God, and I'm looking around, and I believe everybody here is a believer, but you are going to be challenged in the coming days to where if you think it was if you think it's tough the way you envision what we've been studying in Revelation for believers to exist. During the reign of the Antichrist, folks, you're going to have a tough time showing your belief today without somebody ostracizing you or criticizing you or persecuting you. And it's going to put your faith to a test. Now, preacher talked about this. I don't remember it was last Wednesday night, son. I don't remember when it was here recently. He talked about faith. How strong is your faith right now? And that's what kept coming to me today. I could see such a parallel as to what we've been studying here in the time of the tribulation as to what Christians, and there's a, you know, we, the, the scripture tells us back in chapter 7, it's going to be too many to count. We don't know how many, but, you know, I could lose count after 100. I don't know how many people are going to be saved or really will be Christians during the tribulation period, but right now, you are going to be challenged tougher than you have ever been challenged before. So my question is, are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? You know, one of the things you hear from, from Brother Steve in the pulpit, and he says this often, you need to read your Bible daily. Stay in the Word. And I'm going to fess to you, even as I've you know, been up here leading class. I don't like to call it teaching because I don't think I teach a whole lot. I like to just call it leading. There were times, a day go by, I didn't open the Bible. I might have had a long day at work and then overcome by events, so to speak. You know, that's a popular phrase these days. Somehow you get overcome by events. That's a good excuse. You get overcome by events, but... One thing I can I can say, safely say, having get, gotten this responsibility, it has made me stay in the Word a whole lot more than I ever would have before. I got I'll, I'll fess up to you a little bit again. Gosh, I don't know how many years ago. So I don't remember how long I've been doing this now either. Tom Murphy had a Sunday school class here. There were, there were four of us in that Sunday school class. And I think it grew to seven. And there was some, there was one Sunday Tom wasn't going to be here. Well, you remember Tom drove that uh, Ethra bus or one of those buses for a while or something. I don't remember what it was. And why it was up at where I work, I have no idea. I don't know. 
But I walked out one day at lunch, and there was Tom in the bus, and he was waiting on somebody. Or I said, what are you doing up here? Well, he explained, I didn't know. And it blurted out of my mouth. I said, if you need somebody to help back you up, or if you're going to be gone, let me know. I'll be glad to try to do class for you that day. Oh, he said, man, that'd be great. And he said, and these were his words, the reason I think I'm supposed to be leading that class or, or teaching that class is to keep me in God's Word. That was, his, that was his statement to me. And boy, how true that was. I mean, I know exactly what he was trying to say. Well, folks, what I'm trying to get at here, the way your faith stays strong is when you stay in God's Word. The way you stay strong is practicing and studying and I'm not talking about you got to read the whole book of Romans in one week. No, I'm talking about picking up God's Word and going to a part. It may be applicable to some issue or crisis or something in your life, but that's how you stay strong. Well, I got off on a tangent with that. I want to come back to the part. What, we, what we're reading about here is a time when God's wrath is being poured out on the people. I don't know if we're wearing God's wrath right now, but I just know the times are challenging. This may be some of God's wrath. I don't know. I'm not saying it's any of the seals or the trumpets or the bowls. But what I'm saying is we've been living on easy street for a long time. We've not been challenged. You're being challenged right now on every front. So, uh, Just look at... Uh Christians in places like Aleppo are going through right now. Yeah. I mean, you see it on the news on a regular yeah. basis. Yeah. And we've got it easy. Oh, we, we do. We, we, and we've had it easy. The persecution that we are being uh, forced under or exposed to, whatever is the right word there, oh, it's nothing compared to other places in the world. But point is, we've gotten so accustomed to this way that we live now, and now it's, well, what's happened all of a sudden? Folks, we need to open our eyes. Mm -hmm. Well, I think <clears throat> we were in Cape's Cove last week, and I was thinking about the people that lived there back in the 1800s before the park service took it over. <clears throat> My sister-in-law and I were talking about, you know, how far apart all the houses and everything were. Church was the whole focus back in uh -huh. the communities. That's where every social activity, everything took place in the church. People seem to be closer to God. Than it seems like to me the more God blesses us in America, the further away from Him we get. Instead of coming closer to Him, we're getting further and further away, and we're letting things of the world take the place of our church fellowship, our uh -huh. worship and really being close to God because we don't have the problems that we, you know, have had in the past. Say back in those days, you know, when there was no roads, no way to get places. They didn't have ball teams. They didn't have all these things pulling and tugging at you. And I think the biggest mistake that parents make nowadays is they get, they let their kids become involved in too many outside activities and those activities become more important, not just to the kids, but to the parents, than church. And then you, we're raising a generation, and I'm, I have grandchildren in that generation, so I know they want to be entertained. They don't want to. I saw something one time on the internet. It said, why is God not enough? You, you can't just preach the gospel in the church anymore and have it grow, you've got to have all these entertainment and mm -hmm. programs mm -hmm. to satisfy these kids. And, you know, I think that if we don't wake up in this country, like you said, and realize where we're headed, pretty soon we're going to be like these other countries. Well, I'll tell you what scares me. There's one of these days, again, I'm going to go out on a limb with this. I have a feeling. We're going to wake up one day, and it's going to be, oh my gosh, how did we get here, and now how can we fix it? And it's too late. It's too late. I, I, go back to what you were talking about with like those people in Cades Cove. I think, yeah, a lot of what you talked about are the 
kind of secondary things that's happened, like extracurricular activities and self-serving and all that. But I go back to the root, what I was saying just a minute ago, that I believe people in general, and I'm not, and I'm not talking about you folks per se, I'm talking about the 72% that Kathy referenced there a minute ago, will not acknowledge that God above has given us everything that we have. Period. You only have what you have because God has deemed he wants to bless you with that. You've gotten. You know, we, I look around, and you know, most of everybody here is living comfortably in a house, and you, you've got transportation, and I've said before, you've got clothes, and you've got food. You have those things because God has chosen to bless you. And when I look at that, and He calls to me to say, "I want you to lead this class." I'm scared not to. I am scared not to. Because I know what he can do. And if you don't believe he can do, then you've missed the whole book of Revelation that we've been talking about. Because, folks, he can pour wrath on us in a heartbeat. And he can change things at the snap of a finger. How many of you, I, don't raise your hand. I wouldn't do that. But I know there's people in this room right now that could testify your life has changed at that quick by something that's happened. Where a snap of a finger and all of a sudden your life is turned upside down over something. That's how quick God can change something. But God is being ignored and we refuse to look to Him and acknowledge and give Him thanks for what he has given us. And you've heard me say over the last two or three years, I think, it, it just became more ingrained in me. Make sure you give God thanks for what he does. He doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't have to give us anything, but he has. And he has blessed us so much, yet we continue, to, when we pray, and I'm not saying... Because scripture says, ask. But folks, don't focus everything on asking God for something. Take time to give God thanks for what he's done. I think that part of our problem in America today is we have such a sense of entitlement. Mm -hmm. We're entitled to this. Yeah. And you know, when we approach God and ask him for these things, we've got to have a clean heart. That's right. And I don't mean just say, Father, forgive me. I mean, we've got to have a contrite heart when you say that. You... And, and there needs to be sincerity with that. He knows. You don't just blow it off, Father, forgive me for my sins. I need, now, here's what I need to ask you about. Uh -uh. It might be that you need to have a prayer with God and just sit down and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was weak. I did this. Or please forgive me. Don't ask him for anything. You give him thanks and you ask for forgiveness. And try to get, as, as Diane says, get clean with God. Don't you think he knows that already? But those of you who have children, wasn't it a whole lot easier when they came fessing up than you trying to coerce it out of them? Or then trying to cover it up? Or, no, that wasn't me, Daddy. I didn't do that. <laughs> I wasn't around that. <coughs> God knows all this. But he wants you to talk to him and confess and be honest and straightforward. But be sincere with him. Well, let's go back to the scripture here. Righteous are you who are and who were, O holy ones, because you judge these things. For they poured out the blood of saints and prophets. He's talking about the persecution that the non-believers inflicted on the people who believed. And you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. Again, blatant disregard for God by these people on earth. And again, don't we see that today? 
just blatant disregard for God? Oh my, folks, this is, it's a scary time in a way. They deserve it. This angel is saying, whatever you decide, O Holy One, to inflict on these people, they deserve every bit of it. They deserve every bit of it. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Now, I want to, there may be a little bit of different translations. I looked at uh, some of this. One of the other translations, I forgot now which one it was, said another at the altar. Another one said someone at the altar. New American Standard says the altar saying, well, you know an altar can't speak. Can't God makes it. God made a donkey talk, didn't he? I guess he can make an altar talk if he wants to. But the point here is that I believe what's meant by this is somebody who is at the altar. Could be somebody, could be somebody's, I don't know collectively are confirming what the angel has said, saying, yes, O Lord, true and righteous are your judgments. In other words, what you do is right. And folks, that's the thing we need to take to the bank. What God's going to do is going to be right. We may not understand it. We may not agree with it. But it's going to be right. Well, I wanted to read this, Romans 13, verse 4. Talking about they deserve it. I'm going to say it this way. The wiki, the, the wiki, the wicked are worthy of God's wrath. Their day's coming. Their day's coming. Romans 13, 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. Wow. That's Paul's words to the church at Rome. We, we studied this when we went through the book of Romans there. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. God will get his vengeance. You are not going to escape doing evil and get away with it. God will get his wrath somehow, some way. I don't know how it will work. That's his choice. That's his choice. Let's move on to verse 8. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun. Well, does that sound familiar? We talked about from the other seals affecting the sun. Remember, it blocked out a third of the sun. And it was given to scorch men with fire. Well, let's look at what's happened so far. First of all, we put sores on. Remember the first bowl? We put sores on. Second bowl, we affected all the seeds. That was turned to blood and killed every living thing. Third bowl, we just hosed up all the drinking water. Rivers and springs turned to blood. Now, God's going to scorch them with fire. I want you to pay attention to this for just a second. Notice this. It says, given to it to scorch men with fire. What do you do when you scorch something? Burn it? Severely? Candy. Yeah. Most times. You're pointing at one? <laughs> You're, you're burned, but not consumed by the fire. You're not consumed. It inflicts pain. You ever had a bad burn? Doesn't, doesn't feel good. Burns are very painful. Burns can be very painful. Particularly, you get some of those third-degree burns. Uh, in the business I was I was in, I can say that past <laughs> I used to see some data on stuff of uh, dealing with radiation burns. It's bad news, folks. It's bad stuff. Notice what, what God's Word says here. The fourth bowl said, I'm going to pour it out on the sun, 
so that it will scorch the men with fire. And when it says men, women, you count in there too. It's not, this is not gender specific. Men were scorched with, fe with fierce heat. Now, won't you think about that? We just went through a rather hot summer. Only have 76, 77, 78 days in the 90s or something like that. Saw something toward the beginning of last week. It was like a, some, some date in May was the last time the thermometer was below 75 or something like that for a high. I mean, I mean we just had a hot summer. How many did I hear of you folks grumbling and complaining about a 90 degree day and the humidity was up there too and you talked about, oh, I just can't breathe and it's so miserable, didn't you? No, Roger didn't. He's in, he stays inside where it's air conditioned. But I tell you, folks, that's nothing to what this, this scorching of heat is like. God's intent is to inflict pain on the wicked who did evil. And he says right there in his word, men were scorched with fierce heat. And notice this, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent so as to give him glory. Oh my gosh. And you're just wanting to say to these people, what's it take to get through? Where do you think these things come from? Now, this I firmly believe too. I believe the Antichrist is feeding. This is not something that these people are, are you know, I, I look at this, there's got to be some varying intelligence levels of these non believers. They have a leader, the Antichrist. And he's telling them, this is the God above who loves you, who's doing this. I blaspheme his name because if he loved you, he wouldn't be doing this to you. And in this kind of argument you hear these days, the Antichrist is trying to get these people. And so they're saying, well, we don't want God. We don't need God. And God's doing this. Folks, they need to recognize God has the power to do this. Go back and look when the people, when God's, uh, the children were in, I in e that, were in Egypt. So, you remember God had a couple of different plagues, and the uh, sorcerers or whatever, they were able to mimic a couple of them. They could do a couple of them. Then it came to the fertile. When God put lights out on people. They couldn't do that one. And you would think people would learn God has an almighty power to do anything and do all of this, but yet they continue to turn their back on him and blaspheme him. I, it's one of these things, I don't know how you get through to these people. I just don't know. Maybe you don't get through to them. Because there are some people, we know this, there are some people who are flat just going to reject God and say, I'm done with it. Don't talk to me about this. Don't want to talk about God. God has made it more difficult for them to accept Him at this point in time. He's hardened their hearts. Well, He may, but... That's what these He says. Well, he, they have... They, that happened a long time ago when they took the mark of the beast. But I'm going to go back to Scripture, and I've, I've given this to you a couple of times, too. Two Scriptures in particular that says there's going to come a day when every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that He is Lord. And when I read that Scripture, I read, I read that literally. I mean, I think it believes everybody is eventually going to come to the point where they have to acknowledge God is above, and He is sovereign, and He is Lord. Yeah. Yeah. What it says. 
I don't believe, I, I read one commentary, and I think I told you this, where one person says, well, that's just talking about Christians. No, Christians are already doing that. That's right. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and you're a child of His, you're already on your knee confessing that He's Lord. But there's going to come a day, and Kathy and I have talked about this, people are going to have their day of reckoning. There's going to come a day of reckoning for everybody. And you can have a, you can have a day of reckoning in, in a lot of different areas, but there's going to come a day of reckoning where people get down on their knees and they're going to confess He is Lord. I don't know what it, I agree with you, their hearts are hardened. It was hardened when they took the mark of the beast. And I said before, and I told you then, when you took, when you took the mark of the beast, you sold your soul to the devil right then. And there's no getting it back. Folks, this is, and another thing to look at in a way, this is just a preview of what hell's going to be like. It's not going to stop. Do you ever, you think of the torture in hell? I mentioned a minute ago the scorching of a, from the intense heat on that fourth bowl there. Think about continual burning in hell without going away. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to stop. You, I asked you a minute ago about your, if you'd been burned and you told me, yeah, somebody had and it was, it was intense pain, but that got better. You healed from it. Or you could put something on it. You could put some salve or some of that cocoa butter or aloe vera or all that stuff. You can try to ease pain. Folks, you get in hell, there's no ease in the pain. I believe it's a preview as well as anything else. This is going to happen. But oh my, what's getting ready to take place? Well, gosh. I'm not done there. I may come back to those two verses next time, but i got to stop. So, Questions, comments? Apparently, if one looks at this whole broad spectrum of things that's going on, we in the modern, well, in the last five, six hundred years, have adapted a wrong view of death. Death is not final. It is a simple you know, transition from one form, one position in life to another, or else 